Um, I'm a nurse, trained nurse, a uh, psychiatric nurse. I work with people with mental health, uh, mental health um, uh, disabilities and so forth. Um, I, special, I, I specialise in um, uh, self-harming behaviour, suicidal ideation, that's working with females. Um, that's part of my um, background as a psychiatric nurse. I became a behavioural therapist, what's called the Delective Behavioural Therapist, DBT. Uh, some time back through my training, uh, I've, been tr I've been nursing for over 20 years now um, and I have um, worked with females who tend to have a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder uh, and they tend to have uh, dysfunctional behaviours of self-harming and suicidal ideation or some sort of addiction. Um, when I uh, started in Yaldswood in 2012, I started in January 2012. Uh, it took me about uh, eight months to get clearance. I had to get home office clearance. Um, and I had to sign the Official Secrets Act as well, which I thought was very odd. As a healthcare professional, signing the Official Secrets Act is a very odd thing to do, really. But I had to sign that. Um, so that took about eight months for processing, because I initially went for the interview around beginning uh, 2011, and that process took a while. And then I started in 2012, um, and when I initially started the role, I was doing just um, processing, admin processing, as a nurse, a general nurse. Um, I haven't got a lot of experience in the general nursing concept, which they deal with physical health. Um, my, my expertise around mental health. I um, asked about the mental health and well-being of the residents in Yarswood because I wasn't picking anything up. People would come for the medication, and people were on antidepressants. There was lots of people on antidepressants. And uh, I was implied to be a mental health nurse. That's the role that I was implied, that was the contract role that I was implied for. So I think it was, a, it was a couple of weeks I was in there and I spoke to my manager and I said, look, I, I'm not picking up anything here, mental health. I haven't seen anybody come to me with mental health. So that was quite early on. So I started to outreach because I noticed the healthcare department wasn't outreaching uh, to the units. The units, the healthcare was right down the back end of the aisles and the, the units were up the, up the other end. So there was a bit of a distance that you, you'd walk to get to healthcare. Um, and there only, um, it was nine to five. So I'd open the doors at nine and close them at five. So it was like a GP, general practitioners. The model was like a general practitioner service like you'd have in the community. So I wasn't picking up any mental health. So I, so I outreached to the units and I started to look at the, uh, the documentation they used for people who were at risk to themselves was called ACDT. So that's a, an assessment, care and detention um, a document, a risk assessment document. So I started to look through these documents and noticed that the officers were putting down uh, in order suicidal self-harming behaviour but I wasn't capturing these in healthcare. So I was a bit odd. I thought that was a bit odd. Why am I not capturing these people? Where are they going? Um, so I thought that was a bit, so I, I dug a little bit deeper on that and I started uh, assessing, I did a bit of an audit on these documents and found there's quite a lot of people actually suffering with mental illness who were harming themselves and they were suicidal. So I escalated my concern to the manager who then agreed, she agreed that I should focus on the pathway of mental health and develop the mental health services. She agreed with that. I was quite happy about that because that's what we, that's what I was employed to do. Um, and at that point she, she nominated me as the lead mental health. I was the only worker by the way, I was only doing part time work. I wasn't doing many hours a week. Um, so I started to go out and talk to the officers who were very forthcoming, they were telling me about um, we're not experienced, the officers saying we're not experienced mental health, we don't know what to read, we don't know what to assess, we don't know what to observe. So they were missing quite a lot of things, the officer. And the officers spend more of the time with the residents. They spend more of the time with the residents and the residents need people with experience to be able to pick up these non-verbal cues of depression, for an example, withdrawal and things like that. The officers weren't picking these up. They were picking the top end, the ones that were very, very risky, uh, that were presenting very, very risky behaviour. So they were capturing that because it was very obvious. Uh, but they weren't um, capturing the less obvious behaviours, people that were drawn in their units and so forth. 
So that was quite concerning. Um, so I raised this as a concern, I raised this further. And I was constantly raising these issues um, about the value of the, the expert value of people, uh, professionals going in and doing proper assessments. Um, so what happened thereafter when I, I pinged an email out to the whole, all the managers within Yarlswood with the agreement with my line manager uh, saying this is a new mental health uh, pathway, uh, please refer all referrals to myself, uh, include the ACDT documents. And they did that and I was inundated. There was just lots of work just flooding through. And I said, that was, that was odd. One, you know, one week there's nothing. And then all of a sudden I'm getting, you know, lots of referrals. And I'm only working part time. I'm the only mental health worker. Uh, despite the fact the other nurses had mental health experience, but they were just doing general duties, giving out medication, ordering medication, doing blood checks, are they fit to fly? That type of thing. So the main focus was, are the residents fit to fly physically? Yes, remove them. There was no area of concern or uh, raised about mental health. So I, I thought that was odd. As a nurse, why would you not raise things about mental health? What's that about? So I dug a little bit deeper on that. Realised the concerns that there's an undercurrent of people with lots of mental health issues going on here. So this is when I start raising concerns, and that's what. As a nurse, I'm of a duty bound to do that. That's, that's what I signed up to be as a nurse. It doesn't matter what colour, what race, what creed, it doesn't matter what you are, if the person is vulnerable and they need help, as a nurse, I'm there to protect them and ensure that they're safe. And I was raising this with the managers and they were not listening to me. They were, they were talking to me, they were, they were saying they would do something, uh, but there was no action. It was the usual, and don't forget, I'd raised concerns in the NHS, so I knew this type of behaviour. I started the job because I, when I left the previous job at the NHS, uh, I resigned. I then tried to look for jobs in other places. Um, I'm a senior manager. I've never had a problem getting a job up to the point of me raising concerns. At first interview, I tend to get a job fairly quickly. So my track record was pretty good in getting a job. So I started applying for jobs in the NHS through what's called NHS Jobs. It's a, it's a, a government institution where you go through and you would apply for jobs through them. And what I began to realise was I wasn't getting interviews, I wasn't getting shortlisted, um, and I was thinking it was really odd. This started to bring me down quite significantly that I just couldn't get a job. And I applied for over 200 jobs. I just couldn't get a job. I'd go for one or two interviews and I would think the interview went really well and I'd walk out as you weren't successful. And I was I was, I was always scratching my head thinking, what's going on here? Never connecting what happened previously to that timeline. I never connected it. Why should I? I mean, I'm treating it in isolation, so I'm just treating it as I'm going through the process. And uh, I'm realising that I'm never going to work in the NHS again. So I get a local newspaper, and I see an advert for uh, looking for psychiatric nurses in Yarnswood. And then it tells you a little about Yarlswood, it's an immigration centre. We're looking for people, mental health experience, to work with people who are vulnerable in Yarlswood. And I said, oh, I'll give that a go. This is in 2011. Uh, so I, I got shortlisted, um, I got interviewed, and then I, got, I was successful. And I was over the moon. I got a job, I've been out of the job for over a year. I've been applying for jobs in the NHS, couldn't get a job, I was over the moon. I could start paying my bills again support my children, I've got four children, and I've got a mortgage. So I was happy that I had a job. Knew nothing about Yarlswood. Um, I'm basically uh, talking to the managers, and so what's my remit? They say, you're, you're, you're a mental health nurse, you're gonna be assessing people with mental health issues, uh, and you know, do the general nursery bit that you do. Okay, so this is fine. And then I started to realize, as I said to you earlier on, I started to realize, I'm not picking anybody up with mental health issues here. What's going on? This is odd. So then I started outreaching and I started to do the ACDT documents. I do an audit on the documents and realise there's lots of people. They're actually getting box ticked. Okay, these are official documents. Um, they've been rubber stamped by the, the the Home Office. These are official documents used to establish if someone's at risk to themselves. Uh, and they also have official channels for people who are victims of torture. They get assessed and so forth. Okay, I wasn't getting any people referred to me from victims of torture. So I raised it. Why am I not getting anybody from we're victims of torture? Surely we're getting people in that are victims of torture. That's not down your remit, no. 
Yes, it is. If someone has a, is a victim of torture, they're going to have a mental health issue. That's a given. Why? And I was quite as blunt as that with the, with the team. I said, that doesn't make sense. You're telling me that someone that's a victim of torture doesn't have mental health issues. Now, we referred them to the, to the counselling service, they said. I said, all right, okay. So I started to scratch the counselling service and see what that's about. The council service mainly was just about giving people different types of flavours of teas. That's, that's basically what they were doing. They weren't really doing in-depth cognitive behavioural therapy counselling. They weren't doing any type of therapy counselling in that sense. It was all around accept yourself where you are. It was around acceptance, I suppose, in some concept. Accept that you're in a detention centre. Accept that you're going to be removed. And here's some tea but just to calm you down. That's basically the crux of what that was, what was going on there. And that's what they were doing. They were actually giving them, and, and, and I remember talking, and, and it wasn't the want of um, the girl who was leading the service. She actually did care. She cared about the place. She said that her hands were tied. And that's what happens. People get to a point where they feel fear that they say something, they will come to have you come down. And I was not having any of that. I've already been through this nightmare. I'm not going to go through this again. And I'm not going to put up with this. So I'm going to deal with this now. I'm not going to drip, drip, drip each meeting, every meeting, mention this, mention that. So I'm going to put this in writing. I'm going to put it in emails. I'm going to keep talking about it. And this was on a daily basis. I was raising concerns to my manager. And the manager was fed up with me at this stage. I mean, they were really fed up with me. Uh, to a point where they, they started to separate away from me, they weren't giving me any time of the day. Some nurses were saying, just keep your head down now, keep your head down. I said, I'm not keeping my head down, there's people, vulnerable people here, they're not getting properly assessed. And I, don't forget, I don't know the system, I don't know immigration, I openly said that at the beginning, I knew nothing about immigration. And I, all I know is that people that are unwell are not getting properly assessed, they're getting a five minute quick assessment, a quick documentation, and then they're getting shipped out to, to the country. The Guardian uh, editor actually framed this, the culture of disbelief. Um, and he hit the nail on the head because that's what it was, it was a culture of disbelief. They were not believing the residents were victims of torture. They were not believing they were victims. They were not believing they were refugees. They were believing they were making the stories up because they want to stay in the country. That was the attitude the officers had. So, um, these officers uh, who had no experience, they would, they would invite me down to meetings because when you have the ACDT document, you have to close it. The person's settled, are they not a danger to themselves? So you reassess the individual. So they'd invite me down to the meetings. And in some cases, people would become calmer, they don't feel suicidal, and they would start to reduce their, their behavior and they would come off the ACDT. In some cases, they wouldn't. They would remain because they're still at risk. And these people were, a small amount of people that I was seeing, but there were lots of people that I wasn't seeing, and I was raising this issue. Don't forget, I'm the only mental health worker doing this, 400 residents, okay? I'm, I'm working 22 hours a week, three days a week, uh, and I'm not working weekends, okay? They, I'm telling you this because these are this is quite significant. These, these uh, issues are quite significant. I was working three days a week. Um, they were not um, doing the assessments over the weekend. So, for an example, I would write in the diary, could you please assess Mary? She's very unwell. Could you do an assessment on Saturday? I would put that in for Friday. I'd get, come in Monday, a big line going through, not enough staff. Now, that's the failing the duty of care of that patient. That patient would have been removed and deported by Monday. So that person wouldn't have had a proper mental health assessment. They wouldn't have had a proper care. They probably would have had an assessment, are you fit to fly? They probably would have had that assessment, but not the mental health would have been assessed and they would have been gone by Monday. That was, this is when I started to really, this is not right. There's a serious things going on here. I started questioning things a lot. People were becoming very unwell. There was a girl with melangitis. Um, a, a, an officer rang me up and actually said to me, no, I'm glad it was you um, because I've been talking to so-and-so and they're not listening to me. I've got a lady who's in a room. So I said, how long, she, how long has she been in bed? And she's all, she's been in bed for over two days. And I said, well, that's odd. Why hasn't any of the staff come down? Oh, I've kept ringing them all and they just wouldn't listen. They kept saying, give her some paracetamol. She's got a temperature, curtains pulled, doesn't like the sunlight, neck hurting her. As I'm doing the assessment, I'm thinking, is this meningitis? Is this lady got meningitis? So um, I open the curtains just gently. I'm doing a temperature. Temperature's in the 40s. 
very, very high temperature. I'm like, this lady's not well. We need to get her down to A&E quickly. Um, and I, we got the officer's wheelchair, straight into a wheelchair, down to the health, because had to go to the health department to then go to A&E. Uh, and she went, a week passed, and I asked the manager, how was the lady? That's all I got. So what do you mean? What do you mean you don't know? Where, where, what's happened to her? Where is she? Don't know. And that was the... That's a good example of the healthcare department in the care of vulnerable people. They just didn't care where the person was going. As soon as they had that box ticked, that was it. They were gone. Um, there, was, there was lots of cases like that. There was lots of serious cases like that. And these officers weren't picking up this, this quality of care. There were some officers, uh, mainly female, they, they had a little more empathy towards the, the ladies. And they were relatively new as well. These officers were relatively new. They had a six week, six week induction, by the way, officers had. Healthcare hadn't, they had no induction. But the officers had a six week induction of the process and immigration and so. But when it came to healthcare, they knew nothing about healthcare. They didn't know what to capture. They didn't know what to observe. They just went on their instincts. Oh, this lady's been in bed for two days. That's not right. I'll ring up healthcare department, yeah? They wouldn't have known if that was meningitis or if that was a flu. They wouldn't have known any different. So that's the danger of just having officers patrolling that area. That's the dangers of that, the danger of that. And that was one of the reasons why I outreached to the, to the vulnerable people, because mental health, you, you, you become isolated in your room, you don't want to engage. And I was picking up a lot of people uh, that weren't the obvious behaviours. I started to realise from people very quiet, I was doing assessments with them, and they started to tell me stories about victim they were one lady, she her sexual orientation, she was from Africa, she left Africa, and because of her sexual orientation, she would have been killed because of her sexual orientation. Um, and I remember talking to her and she was very depressed. I mean she was in tears and she was telling me the story that she would she went into the river in, in Africa and she would she went to try and kill herself. And someone gave her hope and got her out of the country basically. Um, because of her own belief, her own sexual um, orientation, she was actually being um, discriminated against. She was actually being targeted um, by her village. Um, so she managed to get out of the country and they were planning of removing her back to the country. And I raised the issue, this woman will be murdered if she goes back to her country. Okay? And I, I put documented that very clearly, she will be murdered. I'm verbatim saying what she's saying. Uh, when I was told to do an assessment for victim of torture, uh, I was asked to ask her, does she have any scarring? Does she have scars on her body? Okay? That's no relevance to psychological... That's no relevance. But this was the main thing that was a driving factor to establish within the institution to clarify that absolutely they must have a scar to prove that they've been a victim of torture. That was the only way they got through that system, okay? If they had a scar, well, and if it's a type of scar, well then, yes, we'll have, we believe them. But if they got nothing and they're just telling a story, well, you know, they're gonna have to be, they're gonna have to prove a little bit more. They got a more try. And that was wrong. That was wrong because the system didn't establish, didn't help find out behind, because you can have mental, psychological scarring from war and so forth. Um, and you just couldn't pick that up. You can't pick, you can only pick that up through storytelling. You can only pick that up by sitting down and talking to somebody. Uh, they wouldn't even allow me to talk long periods of time with patients. They used to, when I used to assess the patients, they used to barge in the door and say, come on Noel, are you ready? And I'd look at them and say, what are you doing? That's rude, get out of the room. And I'd look at the, the uh, residents, that was terrible, I'm sorry about that. That's really rude. They would do that all the time. Come on, it's 15 minutes. It doesn't take 15 minutes to assess somebody. It could take a, an hour, it could take weeks. It can take a long time to assess someone's mental well-being. Uh, and that system didn't help that process. So I started to realize very quickly thereafter that people that who are getting assessed weren't getting assessed properly. Some weren't getting assessed at all for mental well-beings. When they're going to their tribunal, for the, this is the last stop shop in regards to their to their um, um, uh, immigration status. Uh, when they were going to tribunals, they didn't have the backing of assessments that would validate their case. They didn't have the backing of the assessments in regards to victims of torture that would validate their case. 
and in some cases, then people would, uh, tribunals would have been thrown out and they would have been referred back to their country. That system has failed those people. And all you need is one case. And I found out, while I was at Yaws, there was a lady who was removed. She was in a gang culture um, and she was a drug mule, basically. They used to, um, basically, they'd cut around the breast area, around the back of the leg, and they'd, put, they'd pack drugs into around the back leg and the, the breast area. Uh, and they were doing that, um, drug mules, vulnerable ladies basically. Uh, they would have been in prostitution, etc, etc. But she went back to a country and she was murdered when she went back. She was only back within a week and she was murdered. And we made it very clear that this lady was uh, vulnerable going back to this particular country. Because, because the fact that she was used in prostitution, she was used as a drug mule, she was vulnerable. We made it very clear on that. Uh, but she went back and the counsellor came to me and said, no, did you hear about so and so she's been murdered. And I said, how did you know that? He said, well, the residents have picked up, because they used to communicate with you, and the residents have picked up and said it. And there was a lot of um, grieving going on around that time. I remember lots of people going into the church and... Um, um, sorry, there's something. Yeah. So she, um, I was told that she was murdered, and um, you feel that you've, you haven't done your best, though. Okay. This, this gets overwhelming sometimes. We're dealing with human life here, um, and it doesn't matter if someone's making a story up. That doesn't matter. What matters is why are they making a story up? What's the, what's, what's the foundation of that? Why would someone make a story up that they're a victim of torture? Not to complete, uh, not what the officer are doing, to completely disregard and say, I don't believe you're making it up, we're going to remove you. Why not just say, okay, you say you're a victim of torture, let's do this, let's do this right. Let's give it a time and space so we can properly assess what's going on here. What's the urgency? Well, the urgency was about a private provider had a ticking clock uh, in regards to, they had to do uh, certain um, jobs done within 24 hours. So they had key performance indicators, uh, KPIs, where they had certain targets they had to meet at certain times within certain days and so forth. And if they didn't meet them, that would impact on their contract agreement so they wouldn't get paid as much money. So that urgency, uh, officers will respond, managers will respond. Basically, from the time you get someone in to the time you get out and deport someone, you get your money, okay? That's the pathway, really. And uh, you've got to do it in a certain way. You've got to do it with quality of care and so forth. These are, they put this in the policies. That's meaningless, that's meaningless in, in action because they don't actually do it in action. But it's in paper, so that suggests that they're, <laughs> it suggests that they're doing the job. They're not. They're not doing the job. They're not doing the policy because what they're doing is, are they fit to fly? Let's check their physical health. Mm. They're fit to fly. Let's get them out. And they, we're talking about, they used to hire out jumbo jets, okay? Jumbo jets they hired out, carrying 400 people in one shot coming from different detention centres, going to Gatwick, and you'd probably have three, four hundred people on one plane, going back to Ghana or going back to yeah, Africa. Or, but crazy, absolutely crazy system. Yarza was supposed to be a short-term holding um, facility, but what ended, Yarza would end up being was that it ended up being um, long-term, um, holding people for long-term. There's no, there's no sense of, well, hold on for a minute, we should be protecting whistleblowers because they are the source of um, honest feedback. We all come out with the same stories without collaboration whatsoever th with the behaviours that managers do to whistleblowers. All exact, going back to 2006, uh, 2006 when I got first raised concerns. Um, same behaviours, they, they, they do a trumped up charge against you, they get you in a wrong position so they can challenge your professionalism. They responded really badly to me, they start bullying me, uh, they start putting me in situations of vulnerability, 
So there was a protest. Um, they, were, they were trying to get me into position to then challenge my professional code. That's what they were trying to do. And I knew that. I knew that's what they were trying to do. Because I was shaking a lot of trees and people were coming up to me and saying, Noel, you need to keep your head down. Managers, I'm not happy with you. You need to keep your head down. Just do your work. Leave the job. Resign. I said, I'm not doing what I did the last time. I'm not resigning the job and leaving what I left behind. I'm resolving these issues. They're going to be resolved no matter what. They're going to be resolved. And, um, which they're not resolved because they're still, we're still going on with them to, to this day. Um, we're talking about 2012 here. This is 2016. So, you know, <clears throat> and there's, that's quite significant that everything's in my head. I can remember it so clearly as if it was yesterday. I mean, that's a good example of post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm just, yeah. It's so clear to me. Um, remembering that stuff. How did it start affecting your uh, life with the uh, yeah, home? Oh, I became a monster uh, at home. I became a monster at home. Um, I just, the demons were all there. I just wasn't well at all. Um, I, went to, I went to see an occupational um, consultant in London and he coined the phrase, um, he said basically, um, this is, an, uh, this is occupational injustice, what you, how you've been treated. Uh, this is when I was going through the tri employment tribunal against Serco. Uh, and Serco, um, they, I mean, they pulled every trick out of the hat they did, trying not to get this into court, in my case, my employment case into court. I raised the grievance at the end of October, the 1st of November. I raised the grievance about the manager who was treating me badly because I gave him a business plan and this manager was treating me really badly. Uh, I, I went on leave for five days, came back on the 5th of November, got marched up to the office, to the senior manager's office, and told I was suspended. With pay. I said, why? Because you didn't follow orders. So, what does that mean? What, what orders have I not followed? Uh, it explains it in the letter. So they gave me a letter, open when you go out, outside. So I went outside, uh, he, he, mar he frog marched me down to the key office, handed in my keys, handed in my pass, I knew I wasn't coming back. I knew I wasn't coming back to that job. I went out, and at that point is when I start making a diary. I got my phone out and I start documenting exactly what I just remembered. So I had, and I had, don't forget, I had emails that I printed off when I was asking questions and so forth. So I was starting to collect information. Um, and uh, I looked at the letter and it says, uh, you're been suspended for not following orders. I was, they still didn't tell me why. So eight, eight months had passed, so I was suspended for eight months. I had to ring in at, uh, before 10 o'clock to say that I'm still available for work, I think. So, uh, and they would still ask me, um, uh, are you still um, pursuing this issue about whistleblowing? And I said, yeah, I'm concerned about what's going on in Yarnswood. And then they would leave me hanging out to dry in, you know, a gardener's leave, I think is the word use, they use. Uh, put me on gardener's leave uh, and really out there grazing by myself, um, isolated. And the union guy was getting really frustrated, wasn't yeah. he? He was getting really angry. He said, I've never known an organisation to treat an employee like this. You're really not telling them what he's done wrong, but you're going to do a, you're going to do a disciplinary against him. Mm -hmm. So they set the day for the disciplinary. And I'm like panicking. I'm saying, but I don't know no, what it is. You defend yourself. <laughs> how, he had no yeah. option. Yeah, I had no option to defend myself. And, and it just started dragging on. Then the senior, senior, because I raised my concerns right up to the CEO and the board of Circo. Um, and then senior directors start getting involved. Uh, and this was about month eight, wasn't it? It was eight months when I got suspended. I got suspended eight April, May. Yeah, April, May. And then um, they, they lift the suspension. Senior manager, se senior manager comes in, suspension lifted. Well, could you tell me what it was that I did? No. <laughs> so you suspended me, you've now lifted it, but you're not going to tell me what I did? No. Or what the investigation let's, Yeah, let, let's, let's forget about that. Let's move on. Let's deal with your whistleblowing. They were not recognising that I'm a whistleblower. Okay, because I've been saying all the way through, this is all about me raising concerns, and that's the reason why you do a trumped-up charge against me. You need to be dealing with the whistleblowing issue here. And every point of meeting that I have, in every um, minute, I, lo I, I checked back this when I was going for my tribunal, head. every meeting has whistleblowing in it. Everything has, he's a whistleblower, he raised concerns, he's a whistleblower. I mean, there was enough evidence to say to them, look, this man is raising concerns about the treatment of people in Yarsland. And I've been doing this for eight, you, you, you then suspend me, a tactic, 
that was a tactic to then browbeat me, mental torture and so forth, my professionalism, my code that I'm worried about. They add in, remember I was telling you about that road where you go down, so they start throwing other stuff in front of the road and that slows you down in your process in trying to get to be the results of the concerns that you raised. And they're throwing this stuff in, in front of you all the time. One of the things they threw in front of me was the disciplinary. Uh, and that slowed it down considerably because they, I went off into a cul-de-sac, they started doing the disciplinary and I came back out of the cul-de-sac because they said, no, we lift the disciplinary. Yarlswood is supposed to be a place of safety. It's supposed to ensure the safety of people to remove them from the country. So it's supposed to be in detention centres so they don't abscond and they're in a place of safety. That's not the case. That's a very clear evidence that's not the case. It's not a place of safety. Incompetent staff, incompetent systems, what you get is you'll get death in custody. That's what you'll get. And that's what's happened many times in Yarlswood. You were both mentally stressed and uh, home? Yeah, I got a diagnosis of uh, so severe depression. Uh, I was put on antidepressants. Um, I wasn't well at the time. Um, um, I was very withdrawn. Um, very isolative, but yeah, I, we still needed to, my partner helped me as well. Um, we needed to get that information out there. And I was shocked because I had raised concerns and I had given documents over to Circle, uh, outlining all the concerns that I was raising. They said he would take it that, and we had a meeting with uh, Circle, an agreement that they do a six week investigation. They just weren't, um, interested in this. You could see the behaviour, same behaviours that I previously experienced, they just were not interested in this. I knew these people are not going to fix this. So I said the select committee have gone on about in institutions, there's a significant thing going on about uh, these institutions and we need to investigate and I'm leaving it for you Sarah to do this right. You have an opportunity to get this right now and it didn't and I resigned and I went out and that's when I started to talk to the press and so forth.